<laughs> but let's meander on back to our seats here. So many precious holy moments this morning. And uh, we're so privileged to be a part of them all. And But when you walk with Jesus, every moment can be holy, I guess. So we're going to read John 21 this morning. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Thank you. That's our scripture text for this morning, John 21. We're picking up in verse 18. Uh, if it's your very first time with us, I've already uh, been out and said welcome, but my name is Daniel. I get the opportunity of serving as one of the pastors here. Uh, and it's Senior Sunday. And, and Senior Sunday is special and it's sweet. And there's probably some tears that either have been shed or have been held back at least. And I felt no better way to start this sermon than to tell the why behind we do and celebrate something like a Senior Sunday. A milestone moment in individuals' lives, nonetheless, some families' lives, nonetheless, but it's also in our church because our strategy as a church and family ministry is to partner together with the families of the home and to make holistic disciples because we're better together than we ever could be apart. That the primary place of discipleship, yes, is in the home, but we as the church are coming alongside them to better develop, disciple, and partner with those families in that. But we celebrate a Senior Sunday for this one reason and alone. That the family's role, the home's role for most families during this milestone, it shifts. It shifts because the primary residence of most students once they graduate high school is no longer under mom and dad's roof. So that role is shifting and we want to recognize that, uh, that that role is shifting nonetheless. But today is filled with a lot of hopes, a lot of plans, a lot of dreams. Questions that you've thought about individually if you're one of those seniors who have graduated, but questions that mom and dad or whoever may have asked like, are you going to college? Where are you going to college? Or should you go to college? What job are you going to get? What are your dreams? Who are you going to marry? How many kids are you going to have if you do get married? Maybe you shouldn't get married. Where should you live? What is the purpose of your life? And so, so many more questions. And today is a milestone event, but it's also a pressure cooker for some that you feel like you need all those questions answered. Because I remember when I was graduating and every graduation since, it's like, what are you going to do now? And seniors, let me just tell you, it's okay to be like, I don't really know. Because the reality in our text this morning that we're looking at as we wrap up this series of Restored is what you're going to see is a God, a Savior, who holds individuals' futures. And that's our text this morning. But I want to give you a recap of where we've been, been thus far before we dive in. In week one of our series, as we've looked at the, pat, the two chapters in John's gospel of post-resurrection Jesus, of him coming back to his disciples, revealing himself to his disciples, restoring them to ministry, but also commissioning them out in their lives. In week one, we looked at John 20, 19 through 23, where Jesus shows up in this locked room with his disciples, and, but because they're f- fearful of the Jews and the leadership that what would happen next, and he over, speaks over them, peace be with you. And then he commissioned them to go and do ministry the way they've seen him do ministry. But these guys are terrified. So a week later, he shows back up yet again to find them yet again in a locked room. But he shows up this time because one disciple wasn't there, Thomas. Thomas had all these doubts, all these questions, but Thomas's main feature that we looked at was his honesty. That Thomas carried about with him this honesty in his life that he was rebuked in a moment though, not before his doubts or for his honesty, but for his disbelief. And we nuance the difference between disbelief and doubt, but the honesty that Thomas carried with him in his past of the doubts of Jesus carried forward in his belief in Christ. Because at the end, once he sees Jesus and Jesus meets Thomas exactly where he was at in his doubt, in his disbelief, his his honesty carries him from doubt all the way to full surrender. 
when he proclaims in John 20, 28, my Lord and my God. Putting Jesus on equal status with the God the Father from the Old Testament to say that he is Lord and he is God. His personal God to Thomas. And then last week we looked at John chapter 21, the first 17 verses where Jesus for the third time meets his disciples, but this time on a sea bank off the Sea of Galilee and enjoys breakfast and points the conversation very pointedly to just one disciple, to Peter. Because for Peter, the reality of the resurrection, the restoration that he had received from the resurrection hadn't become personal yet. Because what Peter needed in this moment and this conversation was to realize that Jesus came to restore even the most broken places in his life. The most broken spaces in his story. And that was the grace that had been extended to Peter. That he needed to know that Jesus was not only a God who redeems us from our past, but this week we're going to look at, we're going to jump in right in the middle of their conversation and carry it out to the end of the chapter. That not only is Jesus a God who redeems us from our past, but he's also a God who holds our future. So let's pick it up. John 21, 18, where Jesus continues on. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself, walk wherever you wanted, and when you're old, you will stretch out your hands. And another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. After saying this, he said to him, follow me. In verse 19, as it encapsulates with this Jesus saying, follow me. Jesus is linking this to the, the verse right above. The statement that he had just made. This confusing yet perplexing yet comforting statement of when you're young, you make your own decisions. But when you're old, you're not going to make your own decisions. That does not seem like life, like how we live it today. Because my young kids, they don't make their own decisions. Like I make some decisions for them. They make bad decisions and then we have to correct them, right? But when I, we're older... The more and more freedom, the more and more things you get in that nature. So why is Jesus saying the reverse of this? Because the reality of what Peter is literally being told by this verse 18 and this statement at the end of it, follow me, is Peter is literally being told by Jesus that following him is an, isn't a one and done decision. That following Jesus isn't a you prayed the prayer, you're good. But he literally is saying to Peter, you keep on following me. Because what it will lead you to, this phrase, you will stretch out your hands, is literally an idiom to point to crucifixion. That Jesus is telling Peter, by Peter stretching out his hands, is how the Romans would kill others that were um, blasphemers or against the government. Jesus is telling Peter, you will stretch out your hands and you will die for my name's sake. That that claim that you made to me over dinner that you would give your life for me even if everyone else denied me actually will come true. That you will stretch out your hands and lay down your life for my name's sake. And don't miss what John says in 18, verse 19 where he says this is the kind of death that he was pointing to that he would glorify God through. That even in Peter's death he would be bringing glory to God. So it's only natural that if that's the end of the line that Jesus has to make an invitation to say follow me. Even if it's leading you to that. Because the reality to be a follower of Jesus is we throw this word around in church a lot. A disciple, a student, or a learner, or an apprentice. You know, there's some jobs that they require you to apprentice or intern under someone before you get the opportunity to do it yourself. Until you kind of figure it out, like most jobs, they kind of require that. Some like mandate it, that you have like a one-year apprenticeship or a four-year residency. But to be a follower of Jesus is to enter into a residency or enter into an apprenticeship that you never graduate from, that you never arrive at. 
that you enter into a relationship where you have a boss over you, if you will, that is showing you the ropes, that's showing you how to do it, that to be a disciple or a follower or apprentice of Jesus is to enter into that relationship that you never graduate from and like, okay, now you got it all by yourself, figure it out. But Jesus extends this invitation to Peter for him to follow him with the rest of his life. All of his life. Every day of his life. Every moment of his life. Even when it's going to lead him towards his very own death. And in this moment, in this text, in this story, Peter, after he receives this word, follow me. We don't get a response just yet. But what we're told is kind of how the narrative is unfolding. Verse 20 of John 21. It says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that will be going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What about this guy? What's happening here in this text? That's the question I want to ask you. Like, is Peter like taking his eyes off Jesus? Has Peter rejected the invitation to follow Jesus? Or is he just merely distracted? He's like, he saw a bird and then it kind of caught his eye. And he's like, oh, what about that guy back there? What's it, what exactly is happening here in this text? Or is it natural that just when Peter finds out his fate, he's curious about another's? Like for you, if you're a graduate, a senior, like you've probably got the question at least 974 times, what are you doing after graduation? And you're probably tired of answering that question. But Peter is curious, I believe, it just what about John's fate? I've received my fate, this is my life, I'm going to follow you, you know I'm going to follow you, I've answered you three times, I love you, I'm going to do this. What about John? Like, what about John? Like, what is he going to do with his life? Is he going to be as good as me? Is he going to be as faithful as me? But what you see here in the next verse is that as this narrative unfolds, is Jesus is not interested one bit in answering Peter's question. Whether Peter is distracted, whether he's getting arrogant, whether he's just naturally curious, we're not really sure. But what we do know is we look at the priority of Jesus in what question or what statement he says next. Verse 22. Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You see, Peter's primary interest was, okay, tell me some more. But Jesus' primary interest was getting Peter's attention to invite him into intimacy to follow Jesus. To follow him. He says, you follow me, Peter. You follow me. That is my invitation to you. But John tells us a little bit about this phrase that, uh, th- that Jesus threw out. If it's my will until he remains, until I come, what is that to you? Because verse 23 tells us, he says, So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this d- disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say that to him, that he was not going to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So we have two disciples here, Peter and John. Peter and John, that both are, their call is to follow Jesus. But Peter's interested about the details of John's calling and his details of his life as well. But John, in the essence of who he is and what he's doing in his story, is he's crafting this letter, this gospel narrative. And he tells us that this exactly is what has happened. Because the last two verses are quite interesting in John's gospel of how he unfolds the story of both Peter and John. He says this in verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And that closes out John's gospel. But what we have here in this final scene, this final narrative, if you will, that's encapsulated here, is we have two guys, and we're kind of left on a cliffhanger in John's gospel, that both have been invited to follow Jesus. But Peter is interested in the details of John's story where Jesus just gets his attention back and says, no, you follow me. 
You follow me, Peter. And how Peter is presented in all four of the Gospels, he's, he's presented as this spokesperson for the disciples. The ringleader for these 12 closest followers of Jesus. This man of action, if you will, that'll cut off a guy's ear if it gets close to Jesus. That he's a man's man, if you will. He's a, a strong leader. He's a leader that will push forward the mission and serve the church well. But that you have John who lounges at the side of Jesus. He's called the beloved. He's pastured well, and, and history will tell us that he dies at an old age. So is one better than the other? Do we need just people of action, men and women who will just push the mission forward at all costs, that will charge the gates of hell like with everything they got? Or what I would say is more of an artist type, a, the beloved who just stays faithful exactly where God puts them for years and years and years. What I believe is you see here these two different individuals that have the same call, but different details. They have the same call, just different details. You see, Peter is called to follow Jesus as an undeviating disciple, even if that leads him and will inevitably lead him to his own death. Which is why John tells us in verse 19, we've already looked at it, but look at it once again. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after he said this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me, Peter, Jesus says. Even if that leads you to death, because even in your death, you're going to bring glory and honor to me. But history would tell us that Peter lived at least three decades longer after this conversation. So does this conversation with Jesus lead him to fear, to hide for longer, to like worry about like, is this the day I'll give my life and stretch out my hands? Or does this almost release a burden from Peter to say, one day I'm going to die, so I'm making today count. I believe that's exactly what it did in Peter's life. It, it emboldened him. It encouraged him to be able to encourage other Christians to say things like this in 1 Peter 4, where he says, Beloved, don't be surprised at fiery trials when they come upon you to test you, as though sometimes something strange will happen to you, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That Peter tells his fellow followers of Jesus to, to stay faithful, to, to celebrate when they're put in hard times. He doesn't fall back on the cultural cliches to say that if you're suffering, it's because you've done something wrong or you have some sin that you need to repent of, that maybe that's true, but it's not always true. That Christ is in control despite our suffering. And in the midst of our suffering, he's with us. And he calls us to stay faithful in the middle of it. That in the fiery trials, count it all joy. In the suffering, in the heartache, stay faithful. Keep on following Jesus. He was emboldened and encouraged. I wonder if the words that when he got a little distracted or a little questioning, a little curious about other people's details, if they rang in his ears over the decades, where Jesus looked at him when he asked a question about John, and Jesus' words to him were, what is it to you? You follow me. What's it matter? What's it matter, Peter? You follow me. That in every area of your life, despite the circumstances, despite the season you're in, you keep on following me. If you're a senior graduate, if you're one of the parents of them, if you're close to the end of your life, you follow me. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Like all these parenting cliches are probably ringing in everybody's ears. If your friends jump off a bridge, would you do it, right? What is it to you? You follow me. Every season, every moment, every aspect of your life. Our call is all of us in this room is the same. Keep on following Jesus. And if you haven't decided to follow Jesus yet, follow Jesus. But the details may be different. 
in your job, in your relationships, in your education, in your public life, in your private life. Your call, my call, same call. Follow Jesus. Details may be different, but the call is the same. And Peter, we see him living this out to the end. We don't get the messy middle of the three decades of, in scripture at least, of like, in decade one, this is what it looked like. But the last letter Peter wrote in the very first chapter, we have these two verses that I think point to the fact that he was faithful unto the end. He wasn't perfect, but he remained faithful in that call. He remembered that grace every time he fell. That's why he says in 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14, he says, I think it right as long as I'm in the body to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as the Lord Christ made clear to me. That that moment on the beach stuck with him for every moment. Reminded him to stay faithful. He said, Christ made it clear to me. Second Peter was written around AD 65, conservative scholars would say. So three decades of life, ministry, and thinking about that one last conversation of him personally that we have at least recorded to, he says, I think it right to remind you about how beautiful Christ is, how worth it Christ is in my story and your story too. Your call is the same as mine to keep on following Jesus. So I'm going to stir you up by way of reminder, he says. Peter was faithful to the end. But what about John? What about John? What about, what about that guy, right? As he turns in that conversation, like, what about him? Was John, like, faithful? Was he as good as Peter, a man, this man of action? Does he match Peter's man of action? Like, what about John? Like, church history tells us John died at plus 90 years old. Did he die as a martyr? Like, there's debate about that. But where do we find John at the end of his life? Towards the end, like... John the artist who put together this masterful gospel also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and most conservative scholars would say also the book of Revelation that this John is who we see in Revelation 1-9 of I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, partner in the suffering and the kingdom, the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. That he is on a prison island at the end of his life because of his faithfulness to the word of God and the truth of Jesus. And at the ripe age of 90, this is where we find him. That he feels as a partner with his fellow brothers and sisters of the gospel to remain faithful to Jesus. That he is no armchair quarterback, but he is still in the game at the end. So how does this message relate from the young to the old in the room? Same call, different details. Young people, seniors in the room, your call is the same as everyone else's call in this room. Stay faithful to Jesus. In every season of life that you're called in, wherever your future is next, know that Jesus is the one who holds your future. And just like Peter knew that his last day was coming... It propelled him to be faithful in every moment. It called him to this faithfulness to Jesus to use the time he had wisely until the last day. And John was no different. John just lived a lot longer. Same call, different details. That Peter and John lived out their calling in different places, in different ways, but they still did the thing they were called to, follow Jesus. And then there's these people in the room, like me, in the, what I'm going to call the broad middle years, between the commas. Because John tells us, or Jesus tells us to Peter, that when you're young and when you're old. What about everybody else in the middle? Because if, if some people in the room would call you young and others would call you old, then you're kind of in the middle, right? You're in this messy middleness of years of, what about all the time in between, well, our time, my calling, your calling is to 
follow Jesus in every season of your life, whether you're parenting toddlers or juniors in high school, junior high students or senior high students or you're single or you're just in your job, just being faithful with where you're at. Your call, my call, same call. Follow Jesus in the messiness, in the boringness, in the everyday moments of life. Knowing that Jesus is better and he's worth staying faithful to. All the way till the end. He modeled it. He taught it. He is worth our faithfulness. And what about those of you who are in the room that feel a little closer to the end than some? That you feel like your days may be a little bit shorter in the number. Like John, at the ripe age of 90, still faithful and following Jesus. That you're never too old, just like you're never too young to follow Jesus, to serve, to love, to give, to go, to pray for the glory of his name. Don't ride it out until the end. Don't buy into the American dream. Be faithful to Jesus. Follow him. As that phrase literally is rendered, keep on following me. My call, your call, same call. Be faithful to Jesus. Follow him no matter what age or stage you are in your life. Trust him in the details and follow him. Go where he's asking you to go. Do what he's asking you to do. Like an internship that you entered at whatever that age was that you decided, I want to follow Jesus. You don't get to graduate. Not until you enter into his presence fully in heaven one day. You don't get to graduate. You don't get to cash it in or cash out. Whatever it is, follow Jesus. So here's the question. Are you a follower of Jesus? Have you made that decision to come under his, his reign, his leadership, to say that he's the teacher, he's the master, and I'm the follower? That's my position in this relationship. And I'm following him. Not that I prayed a prayer one time, not that I, yeah, he sounds good as long as he can get me into heaven, but I'm his follower. Have you made that decision? And other people in the room, if you say like, yep, yep, I'm with you. I'm I'm a follower of Jesus. Are you fully confident that you're letting him lead? Because there's these moments in all of our lives where we try to get in front. And it's usually in these pivotal seasons of something changing that we try to get in front and be like, all right, I'll call the shots on this one. But are you a follower of Jesus and then is he leading this relationship? How I simply want to close that the message may seem just pretty clear cut. Same call, different details. I hope you remember it all week. But I want to give you an opportunity now just to simply get in a prayer posture. Right now, if you would, just if you want to bow your head, if you want to close your eyes, if you just want to look at me the whole time, I don't care. Get in a prayer posture right now and ask under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, are those two questions true of you? Can you honestly say, would people at your job or in your household of your family say, yep, they are a follower of Jesus? And if that answer is like, yeah, I believe people would say that of my life, of my testimony, of how I live and the words I say and what I care about. And the second question is, is are, you very, are you confident at which that he is leading in every aspect or avenue of your life? And if you're being honest, most of us have something that that is not true in. That would you intentionally pray to the Holy Spirit something like this? Holy Spirit, would you hold me, help me, lead me, and give me the courage and strength to give you control? Could you pray that under the quietness of your own heart to just, for the courage and the strength to go where he's asking you to go, to do what he's asking you to do, and that you would be encouraged and strengthened in this next season, this next moment, this next week, to go and to do that. That the reality for all of us is that we may not be able to think creatively like John in the scriptures and write these eloquent letters, and we may never be called to go to the ends of the earth like a missionary, or we may never be called to put under the pressure to die a death like Peter did. 
But each and every one of us can display the love of Christ in our lives by following him and remaining faithful to his word until the end. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, over this body, over each individual souls and family members that are represented in this room, that you would hold us, that you would help us, that you would lead us, and that you would give each and every one of us the strength and the courage to follow you till the end, to the last breath we take on this earth. God, you are the God who holds our futures. You knew the future of Peter and of John, and you know the future of Daniel and every individual in this room. God, give us the strength. Give us the courage. You are the one who holds it all. And we trust you with today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.